Let me begin this morning with a joke. Bob Vashels is a reservoir of uh, clean and slightly humorous uh, jokes. <laughs> And, uh, but I found out that he gets most of his jokes from his grandchildren. So, uh, yeah, take it, take it for what it's worth. So there was a large wall, and uh, people would walk by that wall. And uh, if you listened very carefully, you could hear a faint, uh, a faint cry or word coming from behind the wall. And uh, most people uh, walked on by, didn't stop. But uh, one man stopped, and he, could, he, made, he made it out. He could hear... It was, it was the word 13. And the word 13 was being repeated over and over. 13, 13, 13. And uh, as the man tried to look, it, the wall was much too high to climb over the wall. And so he couldn't climb over the wall. And he looked around and he, and he found a hole in the wall. And he saw a small hole in the wall. And he thought, maybe that would give me a clue. So he leaned over and he put his eye... Uh, to the hole and all of a sudden a stick came through and poked him in the eye and he jumped back and then he heard that faint voice but it wasn't 13 it was 14 14 <laughs> 14 now maybe you feel like evangelism is like getting poked in the eye and here we go again I've got to take my medicine this morning and get poked in the eye there are many reasons why 95%, uh, at least the statistics say, 95% of believers make no attempt to share Christ with their friends or family members. Maybe it's because of a bad experience that you had. The worst evangelistic experience I ever had, I've shared with some of you. I'll tell it uh, again. That's a picture of my brother, more recent picture, but this was uh, back in late 1985. 1985, I went to visit my brother in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, we had dinner that evening. I'd been on staff with Campus Outreach for two years at that time. I've been a Christian about six years. And uh, at the end of dinner, it started. It was the worst, most darkest conversation I've ever had about Christianity. And it was a series of accusations and, a, and just a, a total... Uh, a, a total uh, anger fest, uh, a total rage fest, where my brother and his wife told me that I was the most arrogant person that they'd ever met, that I try to force my religion on them, I think that I'm better than them, and that, uh, you know, what, what makes me think, quoting my Bible verses, that I'm going to get to heaven and I'm better than they are. And I'll just tell you, it was the most devastating moment of my life. Um, after, shortly after I came to know Christ, the first two people that I thought about that I wanted to know, do they know this? One was my father, and the other was my brother. And so I had immediately rushed in, and I confronted them and talked to them about the gospel, doing the best that I could, having no idea that I might have been doing more damage as it relates to their uh, embrace of the gospel than good. And here I was in his home that night wondering, is this really true, Lord? All I've ever wanted to do is see these that are dear to me come to know you. And then to hear that I might be the barrier and I might be the problem. It was devastating. The next morning, we were polite. I got up and left, and I was driving back to Birmingham on I-65. And I was devastated. I was pouring my heart out to the Lord, not knowing what, and, and angry in, in many ways and confused, thinking I was doing the best, what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And I'm the problem. That Sunday, after church, I was waiting for Frank Barker. Frank's the pastor of Briarwood Presbyterian Church, and uh, my pastor uh, at the time. And uh, I waited a long line of people waiting to talk with Frank. So afterwards, I told him what happened. I said, Reverend Barker, I don't know what to do. And I explained these things. And, and what he told me surprised me. Reverend Barker was one of the founders of the PCA. And if anyone knows Frank Barker, you know he's a personal evangelist. Um, and he leads scores of people to Christ in his evangelism. But what he said to me was shocking. He told me four things. The first thing he said is, stop bringing up Jesus in conversations. That surprised me. The second thing he said was, pray that God would open his heart and make his heart open to the gospel. The third thing he said is, pray that God would bring someone in his life 
that he would be list, uh, willing to listen to the gospel from. And then lastly, just love him. Quit trying to save him. Quit trying to be a hero. Just respond to him. Now, I was reading an article recently. Christianity Today was talking about the celebrity pastor syndrome. And uh, sometimes we can have the evangelist, celebrity evangelist syndrome, where we think that some people are gifted in this process, but not me. And some people are called in this process, but not me. And uh, our first week here, John Barrett talked about one of the major tenets of the Reformation, summary uh, tenets of the Reformation. It's not just the recovery of the message, but also of the messengers. And that he reminded us the danger in evangelism is that we think we can leave this to the professionals. But I will tell you, <laughs> it is intimidating to think about that we are called to be a part of this process. Where do we begin? Well, Colossians 4, 2 through 6 gives... Uh, direction on where we begin. And if you look at where the church is exploding around the world, China, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, what's interesting is that it's growing through believers' personal testimonies more than through church programs or through professional missionaries. The places where the gospel is advancing around the world today is the place where foot soldiers are doing their work in faithfulness. It was true in the early church, and Paul says that there's really two principles we need to understand. We need to understand the role of prayer in evangelism, and then we need to understand the process of evangelism and how we fit into that. Colossians 4, 2-6, let me read this to you. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Paul reminds us that foot soldiers, the common man advances the mission by praying missionally and by engaging in the process of evangelism. Now, I'm going to deal with uh, these two principles in reverse. I'm going to deal first with the process of evangelism, and then secondly, we're going to talk about prayer. First, just understanding the big picture of the process of evangelism. In the early um, church, it was Jesus came to a society that was primarily agra agrarian, and they understood the dependence on cultivating the land for survival. When they heard Jesus talk about evangelism and mission, he used uh, pictures, analogies that were uh, easily understood. He talked about sowing, he talked about cultivating, and he talked about reaping. In this passage, John 4, 35, he says, Do not say yet for months and then comes the harvest. I say lift your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Already he, he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, that he who sows and he who reaps will rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you have not labored. Others have labored, and you enter into their labor. So this idea that evangelism is more than just reaping, just the end of the process, so to speak, but it involves sowing, it involves cultivating, as well as reaping. All the kingdom parables, uh, and particularly the ones in Matthew 13, share this idea of small seeds that grow into large trees. And um, in Matthew 13, Jesus is asked to explain the parable of the wheat and the tares. And in explaining the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus says, well, let's, let me help you identify the players in the story. The sower is the son of man. I think that's uh, pretty self-evident at, at a first reading of that uh, parable. But then he says, the field is the world. So the sower is the son of man, the field is the world. Now what's interesting is what he says next is the good seed. I would expect in my study of uh, the Bible and Jesus' teaching, I would expect the sower is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the gospel of the kingdom. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't say, 
The sower is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the gospel. Jesus says the good seed is the sons and daughters of the kingdom. And the implication here is that the sower, the son of man, is sowing his good seed. The sons and daughters who've been transformed by the gospel into the world, and those little agents of transformation are planting gospel seeds of hope and transformation. Now, last uh, or two weeks ago, Matt Bradner was here, and uh, Matt spoke about this idea that uh, we need to think about planting seeds and not trying to uh, not trying to plant trees. I wanted you just, if you weren't here, to hear a little bit of his um, comments as it relates to the gospel is about planting seeds. As we grow as Christians, God takes over more and more of our lives. And we forget that what is now this massive tree that's touching every area of our life began as a seed. And if you forget that, then you become a tree planter. And you start to think that this thing that has overtaken your life for the last 15 years, you've got to somehow get it into another life. Think about the burden, the just physical burden of carrying a fully mature tree around looking for a place to plant it. When we, when we plant trees, not seeds, we either become overly aggressive or overly avoidant. We either say, we're going to get all of the kingdom of God and everything that you need to know about the kingdom of God in your life, you know that's going to change and that's going to change and that's going to change. And you're overly aggressive or you're overly avoidant, which is you're like, there's no way. I mean, imagine this. Imagine a massive, a massive uh, oak tree that was planted in the center of this room. He planted a seed and, you know, a couple hundred years later, this massive oak tree, okay, it, it, it grew in this. Now imagine trying to get a fully mature oak tree into this room. You would just say it's a lost cause. Some of us view evangelism like that. We just look at what God's done in our life and we look at somebody else and we say, there's no way. There isn't a way if you're planting trees. But if you're planting seeds, there is a way. I ask myself the question, how can I plant a seed in my neighbor's life today? How could I plant a seed in this student's life today? What could I do that begins to strike up an evangelistic relationship where I'm warm, I'm winsome, and I identify with Christ? So we need to think about the process as planting seeds. Now, Matt spoke last week, uh, and he came to know Christ in 1997. But back in 1992, Joe Naramore was a student at Georgia Southern University, and a football player named Neil Gooch shared the gospel with Joe, and Joe came to know Christ. Six years later, Joe, or five years later, Joe moved to North Carolina and met a soccer player at the University of North Carolina Charlotte soccer team, a freshman named Matt Bradner, but, and led him to Christ. But six years before that, Neil was a freshman football player at West Georgia, and uh, I met him the first night that we moved to Carrollton, Georgia at an orientation dance. I'd been praying for two straight years, two years. When we moved to Georgia, I knew I was going to, you know, a place where there was lots of lost people, the state of Georgia. <laughs> and, uh, but I knew there were people who needed the gospel. And, and when we talked about expansion into Georgia, it did feel like we were, you know, going to the uttermost parts of the, of the earth, just going from Alabama to Georgia. But I prayed for two years every day consistently when I did pray for God to lead me to people that would be responsive to the gospel. And Neil was the first person that I met. Why do I share that? I share that because our job is to plant seeds. Whether we are the end of the chain in the link or whether we're the beginning, the process involves winsomely planting those seeds. Now, how do we do that? It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to respond to each person. Paul says, first, we've got to be wise. And we've got to be wise in relationship to those who are, with, who are without. Now, that's not exactly the way it's translated. It's translated, be wise in relationship to outsiders. But... It probably means be wise in relationship to those who are without. He's referring to people who are outside the kingdom 
and who are without the knowledge of Christ's love, or who without the encouragement of the body of Christ, or who are without a sense of assurance of salvation, or who are without a sense of direction for decision-making in their family, or who are, who are without a sense of hope when they face grave circumstances. Paul says, be wise in relationship to those who are without, and be wise so that you can identify open doors. And also, once those doors are open, be wise so that you can make it clear when you speak. Sometimes that's the hardest thing, both the identification of these doors and then knowing what to say or what to speak. I shared uh, in the sermon last week a little bit about the Canadian uh, mental health study that talked about causes of homelessness. And I mentioned that it's obvious that um, there are multiple causes of homelessness. There's the poverty factors, underemployment, broken families, drug addiction. But what the study said that was fascinating was that uh, the, probably the greatest explanation for why someone begins to live uh, in a homeless lifestyle is they experience some kind of traumatic alienation, so traumatic that their whole life now is defined by this sense of trauma and alienation, and they can't Basically, every decision that they make going forward is now oriented over the fact that they've experienced traumatic alienation. What I meant to say, I didn't go farther on that, I meant to say what happens was when the gospel comes in our lives, we experience a, transform, a transforming inclusion. Not a traumatic alienation, but a transformative inclusion. And that inclusion now in, the, in Christ, in the body of Christ, in the work of Christ, in the mission of Christ in the world, in the kingdom of Christ, now defines everything about us. And when we, you might say, when we get off track, it's the magnetic north that brings us back on track. So being wise in relationship to those who are without, to identify open doors and to make it clear, really involves being able to see where people are experiencing traumatic alienation and being able to suggest where the gospel can bring transformational, transformational inclusion. It's really that simple. Asking God to give us eyes to see in our relationships, where are we hearing and seeing traumatic alienation and suggesting and offering transformative inclusion. So when a person says... Um, things have really been difficult in my life. And think, I, I feel like my life is falling apart. That should be a sign to us that that's an open door for the gospel. And we want to identify that as an open door. Wherever we, our ears are open, when we hear traumatic alienation in any way, that's a, that should be a sign to us. A little, a, little, uh, a little signal should go up in our minds. And we should ask the Lord, Lord, help me to make it clear in the way that I should speak. Well, how do we make it clear? He says we need to be gracious in our conversations. Not only wise um, in our relationships with outsiders, but also gracious in our conversations. And that's, uh, Paul says, requires being shaped by compassion and being responsive to that individual. He says... Pray that I would uh, know how to respond to each person. Now, let's be honest. Don't we really think that evangelism is really about data transfer? It's about a monologue. Getting to a point where we see an open door, and then what are we going to do? We're going to download a certain body of information, data transfer, and that person's going to absorb it and say, that's what I've been looking for all my life. Please tell me how I can know Christ. Well, it does happen sometimes that way. Every now and then, when you run into a person who uh, your conversation is the last link in the chain, and it's the last link in the chain where everything falls together, and so you, at that point, can deliver that message and explain exactly how they can move from traumatic alienation apart from God to transformative inclusion, and that's what the gospel brings. But oftentimes... We may be an early link in the chain, or we may be middle of the way. And what Paul is saying in the process is it's important that we carefully care for this person at their place in their spiritual journey, and that we move them along the way. Well, we do that by 
shaping our response in compassion, not critical or judgmental, but we want a sense of caring and understanding to come through. And then secondly, we want to be responsive to them. Well, how do you do that? Well, I think it can be like this. Uh, you plant a seed by saying, that must be very difficult. Would it be okay if I pray for you about that? That's something I like to do when, when I'm facing trauma and difficulty. I'd love to pray for you about that. Or you could say, where are you getting some help with that? Do you have anybody that's helping you or guiding you along the way? That is an evangelistic seed because what you're doing is helping them identify they're experiencing traumatic alienation and you want to plant a seed and be a link. I was talking uh, to a guy who wants to come. He goes to PCA churches and he talks to um, churches about caring in a, a God-centered way for your family and particularly your aging parents. And he said, I have a seminar. He called wanted to know if that's something we'd be interested in. Well, that would be an example of that. You're talking to someone in your neighborhood and they're talking about the stress or challenge of caring for parents who live in another city. You could say, well, listen, we have some materials that uh, we've been using or we have a seminar coming up. Offering help in that conversation is both compassionate and responsive. Now, I've got a diagram here. Surprise, surprise, I have a diagram. Um, but I have a diagram that's helpful for me to know how to be gracious and to be responsive. And think about this. Every person is on uh, a continuum at some level, charted from a distance from Christ to the point where they're very close to receiving Christ, to maybe they're on the other side uh, and they're in the kingdom. That's where conversion is. I like to think about uh, there's kind of a middle point in terms of a person's responsiveness to the gospel. That middle point is a Bible there. Their attitude or openness to the Bible is an indicator of what kind of response I want to give them. Um, uh, if they're on this side of that, when there's a lack of openness to the Bible, I will have a different response. But if you notice those four words at the bottom, really every person is uh, on a continuum somewhere between... Uh, a lack of awareness in the truth of the gospel to I'm ready to commit my life to Christ. So a person might be over here, a lack of awareness, and part of my response needs to be appropriate to where they are in their spiritual journey. Or a lack of relevance. They don't understand how the gospel or Christianity is relevant to their personal situation. Or it could be a credibility issue. They don't believe that the message that they've heard from the gospel or from the messengers that have brought that message is a credible witness to them so that they've uh, discredited it. So um, what, I, what I said, that what I like about this diagram is that is the Bible is in the center. The reality is when you get to a point where you can say to a person, well, do you understand what Christianity says about these problems that we're talking about? Have you ever investigated the person of Jesus Christ and the reason why he came to this earth? Uh, do you really understand it? And if they say, well, I don't believe that. I don't, be I don't believe those things. That's okay. I always say, well, do you understand them? Have you ever gotten to the point where you understand the basic message of the Bible? And I usually say, well, you know what? This message has helped thousands of people in, for generations and, in, and across cultures. All, it's a global it's a global religion. The only global religion in the world is Christianity. And it might be worth your uh, benefit to just investigate. Are you willing to investigate? And I like what Randy Pope says here. A person will, can say, well, I don't believe the Bible. And all you need to do is say, well, do you understand the message of the Bible? And his analogy is that uh, if I walked up to you and I had a gun and I had bullets in that gun and you said, I do not believe that you have bullets in that gun. And I said... Well, I have bullets in that gun. And that person says, I don't believe you have bullets in that gun. And I said, I put bullets in that gun. And that person says, I don't believe that those bullets can hurt me. Well, it's fine that they don't believe it. Uh, it still can impact them if I pull the trigger, right? And the truth is, God's Word is powerful and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It doesn't matter if a person believes uh, that God's Word can change them. The reality is, I always ask, or you, would you be open to understanding the message of the Bible? That's if you find a person who's, you might say, on uh, this side of, um, of the Bible. But what if they're not? Uh, I'm going to quickly flow, th flow through this. A person that's uh, just at a point of awareness, we just want them to 
come to the conclusion, this person's okay, they're cheerful, they're accepting. They may be religious and open-minded, but they're not too awkward. Uh, they, maybe they would say, this person's a Christian, they seem intelligent. Or they would say, you know, in their frame of reference, obviously those two things are, in their mind, maybe mutually exclusive, but this person's a Christian and they seem intelligent. The Bible isn't so hard to understand after all. A lot of what the Bible says really fits me. I see the difference between Christianity and just being moral. That would be awareness decisions. And then there's relevance decisions. There must be some advantage to being a firm Christian. She's religious, but surprisingly she's open-minded. An awful lot of very normal people really like this church. (laughs) If we get a person to just say that, guys, that is a step forward in the chain. Don't you realize that? Most of the messaging is such that people discount the presence and power of the gospel because they believe all of the fake news, you might say, about Christianity. If we can help in our, in how we show and what we say, that's a step forward. It'd be nice if I could believe like she does. Jesus seems to be the key. I wonder... uh, who he was. And then credibility decisions. I see the Bible as historically reliable. You really can't use science to disprove the supernatural. That's a step in the chain. There uh, really were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Jesus really is God. And then lastly, commitment. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Uh, There are a lot of costs. I really must do what the Bible says. So it may be that when you go out and share the gospel, that person is the last, you're the last link in that chain for them. But our responsibility in evangelism is to make sure that we're faithful with each person that we share with. Now, Jim and Cindy Grace are involved with International Link, and uh, they are building friendships with internationals and teaching English as a second language. I've got a video just for you to see an example of people who are faithfully planting seeds and being faithful to the place that they find themselves in the chain. Here we go. Our topic is building relationships with internationals for the purpose of evangelism and witnessing. And Jim and Cindy Grayson are going to share with us about your experience of relationship building with Chime and Yaru, how I got started, and uh, what things did you do to build the relationship initially. John and Liz had met Yaru first, and they were going to be out of town, and so they asked us to, to sit with her so she'd feel comfortable. And so we we, we sat down. Uh, Cindy was a little bit later getting there than I was. So I started talking to her, making conversation, trying to see what, what we might have in common. And in that conversation, I found out that she really wanted to learn how to paint. And Cindy had been learning how to paint. And so when Cindy uh, came in and sat down, I introduced them to each other, uh, told Cindy about the, the common interest. And really, that's, that was a starting point. It was a point where they connected and had something in, in common and then started spending time together. So Jim, that reminds me that the Bible talks a lot about that evangelism is really just planting seeds and our role is not necessary to cause the growth but to be faithful in those situations. You know, Paul said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God calls the growth. Let's just talk about the different seeds that you saw and the ways that you saw people planting seeds and God behind the scenes at work in their lives. Well, it's exciting to look back and see how God was calling Yaru to himself. We see that um, she was going to a Bible study on Thursday morning and uh, we just look back in her life and see how God's been working. And we were just one small part and uh, the responsibility wasn't up to us. God was doing this work of drawing her. Not only God drew them to himself, but God drew us to Yaru and Chimei, just giving us a lot of joy. Of all the times we spent together with Jim, Cindy, John Lee, and Liz, and Mary Donna, they have always been uh, patient and humble with us, and uh, we never has, have a question about the uh, gospel or about the social norms here, or even maybe the uh, table manners, and they have always been patient and humble to answer these questions with us. After two years, I get started uh, to think about to become believer. But the biggest problem 
in my heart, it is um, I don't want to be superstition because that's my parents always, you know, mentioned to me, don't do that. But uh, all of my questions in my life and my friend in the church, they showed me, no, it's totally not superstition. It's um, truth. And uh, yeah, after I think deeply and uh, also read Bible, I, I agree with it. Yes, it is truth then I think it's important for me to accept Jesus as my Savior in my, for me. And Yaru and uh, Jimei are members of our church now, but I thought it's fascinating that uh, when asked, he picked up on t uh, how they made him feel. He said they were patient and humble. The, the gospel was not just what they were saying, the gospel was being experienced by how he made them feel. And I've got this uh, diagram uh, up. Uh, it says, use your gifts. Evangelism is a team effort. The reality is that everybody's been given gifts that can contribute to the advancement of the gospel. Not just the building up of the body, but the advancement of the gospel. So you heard there that uh, Cindy has an interest in painting, and they got Mary Donna involved, and that was a way that uh, the Lord was using uh, other people in the body of Christ. But Jim also told me that uh, they've been hosting a Bible study now on Friday nights, and uh, sometimes as many as 30 internationals attend this Bible study. They, they move it around and in, 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 in homes. But they had over 30 people from their Sunday school class sign up to bring meals for these Bible studies. It's just a small seed. It's just a small step. But the recognition is that it takes all of us working together to advance the cause of Christ. One of my favorite sayings is, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Let no one be guilty of doing nothing. As it relates to advancing the mission in the world, we can't assume that the professionals are responsible. In fact, Ephesians 4 is very clear. It says that God gives us spiritual leaders to equip us, the body of Christ, equipping the saints to do the work of service. And he's not talking about church work. He's talking about the work of the church. And the work of the church is the evangelism and the discipleship of the nations. That's our responsibility and our privilege. So first, the process involves, uh, it involves both... Um, being wise, and it also involves being gracious. Now, I mentioned that the most difficult moment of my spiritual journey was that conversation that I had with my brother. But about seven years later in the conversation, we were having Thanksgiving at my parents' house. And uh, for seven years, I had prayed for my brother, and uh, I had worked hard not to bring up the gospel <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, not talk about what I was doing. It's probably very awkward. You can only talk about Alabama football for so long, right? And um, so we were putting the kids down, and my brother said, Hey, can I talk to you? Uh, I said, Sure. He said, Can we meet in the kitchen? And immediately that sinking feeling, that sick feeling came over me. I thought, I've done it again. I've offended him. I've said something, and he's very upset. So we were sitting in the kitchen. He came in. I was sitting in the kitchen. He came in. He said, I want to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, do you believe in grace? And I said, what? And uh, he said, do you believe in grace? And I thought, he's going to set me up. He's going to say, you believe in grace and you've not treated me with grace. I thought, oh my goodness, here it comes. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, Randy, wh where do, where's this coming from? And uh, you know, these, these comments coming out of his mouth, I was like, where's he coming? He said, well, I need to know. Do you believe in, a gra in grace? I don't believe God's just going to give salvation away. That sounds too easy. What do you think? And I said, who have you been talking to? Turns out that he said, my neighbor, uh, a couple moved in next door to them, and the wife started a tea or a coffee where she invited women from the neighborhood to come to a little tea and then talked about she likes to study the Bible and she invited others to uh, be a part of this. And so my brother's wife was going to this Bible study, this next door neighbor. Turns out he was a PCA elder uh, at a PCA church there in Nashville. And uh, he was, um, they were building friendships with them. And so she was listening to some tapes and, 
she gave, uh, my, my brother's wife gave these tapes to my brother. She said, listen to this. It's some things I've never heard before. He said, have you ever heard of a guy named Chuck Swindoll? You probably haven't heard of him, have you? I was like, yeah, I've heard of him. He said, he's talking about grace. He said, this, this is too good to be true. What do you think about it? And, I, and so we began to talk about the gospel. And I, I was just so overwhelmed. And I said, you know, when did you start pursuing this? When did you, you, know, when did you start investigating? He said, you, and this was... He wasn't a believer or wasn't clearly identified as a believer at that time, but he said, yeah, I didn't start seeking this. He said, this is like it's been seeking me. He said, this is if God's been calling me. And uh, I said, you're probably right. Um, <laughs> and it takes place when we commit not just to engage in the process, but also when we're committed to be de devoted in prayer. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us that God may open up to us a door for the word. Pray that I may make it clear in the way that I should. Paul says that kingdom prayer requires being alert and it requires being thankful. He says, pray that we'll be alert, but also pray with thanksgiving. What does it mean to be alert in prayer? I think one thing it means is be expectant. Be expectant. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul says, a wide door of effective service has opened for me and I have expect to find many adversaries. So we would expect wide open doors and we would expect many adversaries. Ephesians 6 talks about the battle and the struggle is not just between you and the person that you're talking to. There's always a third party involved in every gospel conversation. And Ephesians 6 says it's the principalities, it's the demons, it's the spiritual forces, dark spiritual forces waging against the progress of the gospel. But the Bible also says that there's another force. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the voice of the Holy Spirit that's overcoming the voice of the deceiver. So we should be alert and that we're expectant, but also we're alert and that we're militant. But we also should be thankful. Luke 10 talks about uh, Jesus talking to the disciples. He says, do not rejoice uh, that the demons are subject into your, in your name, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Be so full of joy that God has saved you that uh, you're rejoicing not in your circumstances, but in your eternal stance with God. And Romans 8 talks about trusting and believing that God is going to give good things to us and He's going to, He is going to get the glory. That allows us to be thankful in all circumstances. Now, Lamentations 2 is a prayer verse that I've claimed for many years. It says, Arise, cry out in the night at the watches of the night. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to Him for the lives of your little ones. That's the New American Standard. It says in the NIV, For the lives of your children who faint from hunger at every corner. We need kingdom prayer for God to bring life to those who are fainting and to those who are dead. I'll just ask you that probing but convicting question. Of all the time that you spend in prayer, how much time do you spend praying for lost people? It's very convicting just whenever you bring up the subject of prayer. But then, how much time do we actually spend praying for the lost? I'm not going to go over this uh, for time, but I want you to reach under your seat and pick up a little card. And if you're in the overflow rooms at the doors, there's a little card there that you can pick up as well. And I have on one side verses that give you specific prayer requests that you can offer for lost people and for salvation. And so there's about five specific prayer requests. But if you look on the the back side, it says your top ten prayer list. Write down the names of ten people that God is placing on your heart who are not followers of Christ. Begin to pray consistently for them. This list can include family members, lifelong friends, neighbors. And you may, maybe you have that. But just think about this opportunity for evangelism in our city. What if 500 of our members were praying for 10 lost people? in this city? What if 5,000 people in this city were being prayed for that God would open up their eyes, their, their blind eyes, that uh, they would see the light of the gospel, that they were praying 
uh, to be freed from the slavery of sin and its temporary allures. That they were praying that Christians would take opportunities to plant seeds. How would that transform our city? How would that transform our neighborhoods? How, the, how would that transform our families? How would that transform our church? Now, you see this painting here. I have it, uh, I had it uh, sent to me, this, the same artist that uh, did this painting, uh, did a painting for the governor of the universe, uh, the governor of the state of Kentucky. And the governor of the state of Kentucky just hosted an event for campus outreach for the state of Kentucky, all the campus outreach. He's been so impressed with the movement of campus outreach. And they gave this painting uh, to the governor of Kentucky when they talked about this is what campus outreach is all about. Now that's um, a Mount Appalachian Mountain in Kentucky with, with a waterfall there. But um, if you're able to look closely in the picture, so I called the artist and I said, can you send me a, would you make me a painting of that same thing? And she said she would. But uh, she's a former alumni of the University of Kentucky who came to know Christ through the ministry of campus outreach. But you can see the, the vast forests that are there and the beautiful trees and you see the foliage. But then you begin to see below the subterranean level and you see all these roots that are growing. And if you look right here, you see a seed. You see one seed. And that's how the gospel goes forward. We focus on fruit. God focuses on seeds. How many apples, excuse me, how many seeds are in an apple? Um, somewhere between four and six. It's not always the same. But I like to ask this question differently. Not how many seeds are in an apple. How many apples are in a seed? You see, the gospel goes forward when believers plant seeds, seeds that God multiplies. I want to challenge you this morning. My challenge is this. Accept the call to love small. That's how we advance the mission. Through small prayers, through small acts of love. It was said by Mother Teresa, we can do no great things, only small things with great love. Now, if I ask you the question, when did MCO start? I don't know if you probably say, well, when Bill Pearson quit medical school <laughs> and it happened here in Augusta and then went to our elders and said, I believe God's called me to reach medical students. I would say it happened earlier than that. In 1987, a girl named Peggy Pearson was in my wife's discipleship group. This is a current picture of Peggy on the right, or on your left, and, um, and Sandra in the middle. But Peggy came to my wife, and she said, I'm so broken over the fact that my brother's lost, and he's not interested at all in spiritual things. So Sandra and Peggy made a pact of prayer. Plant a little seed against the powers of darkness. Little did Bill know that God was going to hijack his plans and transform, in, transform him uh, and include him into the gospel of the kingdom. Planting seeds. Uh, that picture that I showed earlier, Darren Franklin, is the African-American uh, in 1986 uh, that uh, played defensive back for West Georgia. The picture over here is all the defensive backs from West Georgia. One of the things that was so discouraging to Darren was that nobody that he shared Christ with in the four years of college committed their life to Christ. Darren was so faithful to share the gospel, but nobody that he shared with uh, came to know Christ. He called me last summer and he said, I just want you to know, 16 of those 22 guys in that picture have prayed to receive Christ over the last 20 years. He said, I've prayed for them by name for the last 20 years. I've prayed for them by name over the last 20 years. Now, this is the end of the story the one on the left is my brother, but the one in the middle is Jim Henderson, and this is their families together at a wedding. And I saw Jim and Lynn, those were the next door neighbors that moved in next door to my brother. And I, uh, it's a physician there that's a pastor, uh, uh, elder at PC Church. I said, Jim, I've been wanting to talk to you. I prayed, I told him the story when I left Nashville, and I prayed that God would send somebody into my brother's life that he would listen to. And I just want you to know you're an answer to that prayer. And he said, Mike, you're not going to believe this. He said, I don't get any credit, but let me tell you what happened. I said, okay. He said, 
I was in an officer's training where the, the pastor was taking the officers through, through some discipleship material. And he said, we'd gotten to the point where the assignment for the week is to share the gospel with somebody, just one person. And he said, I'd, it, I'd been on call that weekend. It was Saturday afternoon. And he said, I had to rush to the discipleship group. And I realized, I haven't shared the gospel with anybody. And he said, I looked out my window and your brother was cutting the grass. <laughs> and he said, well, Lord, I probably should you know, have better motivation. But he said, I walked out. He said, is this the most awkward thing you can imagine? I walked out into his yard and waved him down and he stopped. And he's sweating and I'm sweating. I said, Randy, I got to tell you something. It's really urgent. He said, yeah, what is it? What is it, Jim? And Jim shared the gospel with him. And Randy said, could we have lunch and talk more about that sometime? And uh, Jim said, sure. He said, I couldn't believe his openness. Well, I want you to know, God's calls to, called us to plant seeds. He has no problem in causing them to grow, except the call to love small. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, that we can be a link in the chain. We never know where we are. At the beginning, maybe just sowing those seeds of credibility, uh, possibly just helping people understand uh, that Christians uh, are thoughtful, Christians are caring. Or maybe we're at the very end of, of the chain. But give us a vision for the praying for the lost and participating in the process, being faithful to pass that person along to the next person by giving gracious words and caring words. Thank you for the people that uh, you used to bring me to faith in Christ. And I pray for each person here to think with thankfulness for the people that you used to bring them to faith in Christ. And then, Lord, use us to be those people in this city and around the world. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. You're dismissed.